Coming up on Ag Week TV, devastating drought conditions spread in three states, but there is a bright spot for some higher wheat prices. I'm Michelle Rook. I'll take you on a tractor ride today through southeastern South Dakota and northeast Nebraska. And I'll be up in the air in South Dakota at one of the few ag aviation schools in America. Welcome to Ag Week TV, I'm Shauna Olson. The worsening drought is devastating for some in the Dakotas and Montana, but there seems to be one bright spot. Weak conditions are at some of the lowest ratings in over a decade and prices are rallying amid worsening drought throughout three major wheat producing states. According to analysts, the U.S. crop started deteriorating in May and has declined rapidly in the last four weeks. Analysts suggest it will be a short-term rally, which makes marketing a challenge for growers. So there's two strategies to look at. The more classic um, marketing tool or technique is to try and sell into the rallies. As, you, as the rallies start rising, you start selling small, small increments you know, each day or a little bit each week to say, all right, we're going to start averaging up for the price rallies. Well again in the drought conditions when you don't know exactly how many bushels you're going to produce that becomes a lot more challenging. The other strategy which again takes a pretty quick trigger finger is to wait for the top to come in and as prices begin to fall start selling more aggressively on the downside. Olson says the top is probably in once combines start to run and the market sees actual yield results or the weather shifts and the damage has been mitigated. Randy Martinson with Martinson Ag Risk Management in Fargo says the spring wheat market seems to be changing every day as the drought region expands. You basically can cut North Dakota, South Dakota, you, you throw that in the mix, kind of in, uh, in half. Anything, well, Bismarck and West, the crop's pretty much gone. There's not much left out that far. You go from Bismarck to roughly the Jamestown area, maybe a little farther, and that's where they're going to have to combine. It looks like there's going to be, you know, at least something out there that they're going to have to go get. It's going to be a smaller crop. President Trump's recent announcement that he's reversing some Obama-era Cuban diplomatic efforts is raising concerns among ag state lawmakers. Cuban trade was embargoed for 50 years, but it's potentially a very large market for U.S. crops like beans, peas, and lentils. North Dakota Senator Heidi Heidkamp has been working to open trade with Cuba. She went there with the president last year. Currently, all U.S. exports to Cuba require cash up front, while other nations offer credit to Cuban importers. There's a whole group of us, bipartisan group, that talk about Cuba, um, talk about kind of where we are right now with Cuba and can we build more support. My concern is that we've always had the ability to trade with Cuba, we just can't finance um, ag product trade. And so uh, along with Senator Bozeman, I have a bill that would allow for private financing. Um, you know, whether the president would sign that bill, I don't know. Heidkamp says she's been encouraged by her talks with Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue, who has been supportive of trade with Cuba. The EPA is starting to write a replacement for the waters of the U.S. rule. The agency is re-evaluating the definition of WOTUS in the Clean Water Act and is gathering input from stakeholders. The EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers recently filed an official proposal to withdraw the 2015 rule over the concerns of farmers. The WOTUS rule would have greatly expanded the EPA's federal jurisdiction and scope of waters that are subject to Clean Water Act requirements, including the Prairie Pothole region. It was highly controversial and largely opposed by the ag community. Farm groups are relieved and are hopeful they can work with the EPA to build a practical plan to safeguard water quality. It takes a special set of skills to be an ag pilot. In fact, there are only about 4,000 spray pilots in the U.S. and just four schools in the country that train ag pilots. Mikkel Pates recently visited one of those in Madison, South Dakota and got a bird's eye view. A family with roots in Montana, North Dakota, and South Dakota has been teaching ag aviation since the 1940s. Clear. I was flying before my feet would reach the pedals. Morris Riggin has been teaching ag pilots since he was 19. He started flying about 10 years before that. 
I don't ever remember not being in an airplane. The Regan family has been up in the air for about 100 years. Morris's great uncle was a World War I fighter pilot, and his dad, Wayne, was a flight instructor in World War II. After World War II was over, the company he worked for in Mississippi said, hey, we're going to start this new crop dusting business. He says, we don't know anything about it. Would you like to hang around and do it? So that's how dad started spraying. Wayne started Riggin Flight Service in 1947, teaching crop dusters. Back then, a lot of the people that were into agriculture were ex-military. So you take them a couple days, you'd show them how to fly low, and we had people actually flagging back then. We use GPS now, you know, GPS for everything. The light bar that shows us left and right, of course, is mounted up on the cowling. Initially, when we first got them, we had them in the cockpit. Then we realized that was, that was too close. You need to look out while you're flying. But as the planes got bigger and more expensive, insurance companies wanted pilots to be trained better. And so that's how I came into kind of dedicating my flight school to doing agricultural pilots. There's no graceful way to do this. Got to be pretty fit to do this. <laughs> Just get into the plane. Ag Aviation takes many specific skills for safe operation in a business with no margin for error especially with a loading airplane, because every time you turn, it's different. We teach them the basics, you know, how to go find the field, how to scout the field from the air. Then we actually teach them how to fly low. So this is the height, about 10 foot. There's just some people that, when it gets right down to it, aren't cut out to fly low. You were talking about the ex-military helicopter pilot. He was trained as a medevac pilot. You know, they go into hot landing zones and they're being shot at. We flew down across the field, I gave him a demo, right? He, and on the way back, he looked at me, he says, that's enough of that. He says, I've never been so scared in my life. Well, that was a nice little flight, very yeah. smooth landing. Well, nothing that 40,000 hours won't teach you. <laughs> Regan Flight Service teaches about 20 new ag aviation students a year in an industry that could use about 200. For Ag Week, this is Michael Pates at Madison, South Dakota. According to Riggin, the time and cost to become a certified aerial ag applicator is six months and about $43,000. Coming up on Ag Week TV. I'm Michelle Rook. I'll take you on a tractor ride today through southeastern South Dakota and northeast Nebraska. My name is Joel Kaler owner-operator of Kaler Farms in Lidgewood, North Dakota. We make a patented product called the Cornstalk Guide. It's made out of UHMW, ultra-high molecular weight poly, which is extremely durable. Typically what you'll see on corn heads is the idler chain in the sprocket sticks out. We attach to the side of a snout. Our product will keep all the wear off the snout and get it to come into the head smoother without bouncing. Okay, all you lefsa makers, it's time to boil potatoes and roll that dough. Home of Economy is looking for the region's best tasting lefsa to compete in the Hostfest Lefsa Masters this fall. Home of Economy is your home of lefsa, and as an official pre qualifier, we're conducting lefsa contests at six of our North Dakota stores. Each top winner advances to Hostfest for a chance to be crowned the Lefsa Master. So grab your apron and register online at homeoflefsa.com. If you're thinking about selling a piece of land or you're looking to sell some farm equipment, or if you're thinking about a retirement or involved in an estate, give us a call. We'll sit down and tell you all about the Steffes way. We think it's a good way. That's how we approach it. If any of those are in your plans, give us a call or go to steffesgroup.com. Learn all about us. Hope to hear from you. Introducing the new Challenger 1000 series, tractors unlike any other manufactured by Agco. Redefining what a wheel tractor is capable of when it comes to wheel slip, power to ground, and fuel economy. Today, it's not enough just to be tough. You've got to be smarter than everyone else, too. Contact your Challenger dealer today to get in the seat of the new Challenger 1000. Superior engineering, superior performance, superior productivity. The next generation of tractors from your Challenger dealer. 
Celebrate 175 years of Case IH equipment heritage with a limited edition Case skid steer or compact track loader painted with the same red paint of the venerable Case IH farm equipment line. Only 175 are being built and they're going fast. Built to the same specifications on the same assembly line as the award-winning regular Case models, these machines are a working piece of history. Get yours before they're all gone. Hurry into your local Titan Machinery location or go to www.red175.com to learn more today. Many farmers are looking for ways to add value to their crops. Mike Swanson and his wife grow winter rye at their northwest Minnesota farm. As Jonathan Knutson reports, they also distill some of their rye into whiskey at their operation Far North Spirits. Spring of 2019 is when we'll first be able to, to say that's the rye that we harvested. Mike Swanson grows winter rye on his farm near Hallock, Minnesota. It's planted and germinates in the fall, goes dormant in the winter, begins growing again in the spring, and is harvested in the summer. So this will be harvested in late August. Uh, we use the same as equip equipment as we do wheat. The crop is rare in Minnesota, and Swanson puts it to special use, making whiskey at his nearby distillery. So that'll be distilled in late 2017, probably December, and that'll first be ready in 2019. Far North Spirits also makes vodka, spiced rum, and two styles of gin, but Swanson is most excited about whiskey sales. With making spirits, I learn something new with every batch. I know I'm never going to learn it all, but I know I'm never going to run out of things to learn, and that's the most exciting part for me. Value added is the holy grail of modern egg. Ride a Whiskey is a great example. For Egg Week, I'm Jonathan Knutson. The Swansons opened Far North Spirits in 2013. They plan to expand the whiskey line, including bourbon. Many might say there's few things better on a beautiful Saturday than a ride in the country. For those participating in an old iron tractor ride, traveling on an antique tractor at 12 miles an hour makes it even better. Michelle Rook has more from Yankton. Nearly 200 tractors from six states, including New York State, are participating in this year's WNAX Tri-State Old Iron Association tractor ride. Participants rode nearly 125 miles over the two days, and there may be no better way to tour the countryside than behind the wheel of your favorite tractor. Each year we pick a different route in South Dakota and in Nebraska, and we usually do it in October and November. And out of the 11 years, we've never driven the same route twice. Jim and Brenda Fouts traveled the 1,200 miles from New York for their seventh ride. So what keeps them coming back? Well, the camaraderie for one thing. That's a big thing. And see how the other farmers are doing things. For other riders, their love of tractors keeps them returning. And each tractor has a story. A lot of these tractors are from their grandpa or their dad, and they've pulled them out of the trees, restored them. Well, that's a 1951 Fleet Line Oliver 88 Standard, one I bought for rides. This year's ride was once again dominated by internationals, and the oldest tractor dated back to 1939. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Week. Participants in the ride ranged from 17 to 89 years old, and many couples shared the ride. Still no rain for some, too much for others. What does the coming week hold in your agri-weather forecast? And later on the AgWeek TV Soil Health Minute, how the Red River Zoo is teaching kids about agriculture. Martinson Ag Risk Management offers a variety of crop marketing and crop insurance packages to our customers. With over 40 years of experience, our dedicated staff works hard to ensure you get the best advice on crop insurance, marketing, and risk management. Contact Randy or any of the staff at Martinson Ag Risk Management today at 701-205-4200 or visit us online at martinsonag.com. 
This is Dennis Belisky reminding you we do auctions and we do them well. You've built your operation with hard work and when it's time to sell, all or part, you deserve the best. Details from repairs and preparation to promotion and settlements are not routine. Chances are you'll only do this once, so we'll tailor an auction just for you and get it done right. On site at your farm or added to one of our highly successful Alaris Center auctions, we have the skill, reputation, and integrity to meet your needs with best-in-class commitment and quality service. Find us at resourceauction.com or call 701-757-4015. My name is Carson, and I'm a fourth generation corn farmer. The corn that's grown in North Dakota, you could probably trace all over the world. Back growing up, it was always hauled to the local elevator, and now we haul directly to an ethanol plant who processes that corn into a clean burning fuel. The North Dakota ethanol industry uses over 150 million bushels of corn and returns $640 million to the state economy. My name is Joel Kaler, owner operator of Kaler Farms in Lidgewood, North Dakota. We make a patented product called a corn stalk guide. It helps guide corn stalks into the grabs in the chains a lot smoother without losing corn. The corn stalk, when it comes off of our product, it's already on the gathering chain instead of being able to hit that idler. Our product will keep all the wear off the snout and get it to come into the head smoother without bouncing. Every day across America, excess food is gathered by a network of good people at local food banks, giving hope to millions of children who struggle with hunger. They've earned their wings, and you can too. Together, we can solve child hunger. Support Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. Summertime weather patterns are often kind of muddled because individual storms move fairly randomly. You may get a heavy thunderstorm in one air that's been dry, and you may get an air that's been wet that goes dry or the other way around. But as of mid-July, I really think the overall summer weather pattern is finally, at least to my eyes, becoming evident. And the basic gist of it is the western part of the United States is hot and dry. The eastern part of the United States is definitely cooler and warmer wetter, and in between, well, that's where the mix is, and that's where we are. Basically, it's because for so much of the summer, there's been a ridge in the upper atmosphere over the west and troughing in the eastern part of the country, and that's the way it is this week. There was about a two-week period in mid-June where this won over and really pushed back into much of the central plains, but generally speaking, it's been pretty warm, but it's been hot, downright hot over the western Dakotas, and most of the summer in eastern Minnesota, Wisconsin, northeast Iowa, it's not been particularly hot at all, and with the jet stream generally coming out of the northwest. We've had storm systems that have started here in the northern plains, but they haven't really gotten going, gotten widespread until they've tracked on down south and east of us. Well, the heat has been coming and going. It's been back in the northern plains this week. I do look for the ridge to flatten just a little bit over the course of this week. I think we'll still have warm to hot weather for the first part of the week. Might cool a little bit later on, but I doubt that that cooling will be a long-term cooling trend, which maybe take the edge, maybe beat back the hundreds and nineties and get back into the seventies and eighties for a while. I doubt it will really stay particularly cool. Here's the overall pattern in terms of the uh, U.S drought monitor and you can see how it's really the western Dakotas in through eastern Montana. That's the part of the country that has drought right now, most severe drought. When you get into Minnesota, northeast Iowa, Wisconsin, storms have started in this area and then increased as they've gone to the east and that's where this pattern basically comes from. So what's going to happen this week? I look for maybe one round of storms to come through about oh sometime in the early part of the week dropping on down to the south. Generally speaking we just just had typical July weather. Spots of storms here and there. Note the monsoonal flow taking over coming up out of the southwest. That will play a role. As we get into the second week of the forecast period, we're actually talking about the same sort of thing. Storms will start in our region and then maybe drop southward. So it remains to be seen if those will be big or not. The heat, which will start off next week having retreated a bit, is likely to come back. So it looks like it will be overall the next two weeks generally fairly warm with precipitation only spotty across the northern plains, and that's just the way it looks like it's going to be. So the summer weather pattern is now evident, hot and dry west of us, cooler and wetter east of us, and our region, mostly northern plains, a little too dry. 
Field Drainage Inc. has perfected the art of agricultural drainage by helping hundreds of farmers since 1978. We are a second generation family owned business for over 35 years. The Field Drainage Inc. team will work closely with you to conduct a thorough analysis of your needs and expectations. Provide an estimate that fits your budget, perform all work in a timely and professional manner, and provide continued service after installation. Field Drainage Inc., your trusted drain tile installation company for over 35 years. Premier Shortline USA is your dealer for Meridian storage and grain handling. 50 years ago, Meridian Manufacturing designed the first smooth wall hopper bin. This innovation set the standard for hopper bins across North America, completely self-cleaning with no obstructions. Smooth wall hopper bins have become the preferred choice for safe and efficient storage. For temporary grain storage to complete systems, contact Nate or Brent at Premier Shortline USA. WDAY 970 AM has added the Red River Farm Network to its lineup. Join the Red River Farm Network team as we partner with Ag Week to cover the area's number one industry, agriculture. Join us Monday through Friday for Country Morning at 7 AM. Opening markets at 8.30. Market updates at 9.30, 10.30, and 11.30. Closing markets at 1.30. We're committed to reporting agriculture's business on the Red River Farm Network, Ag Week, and WDAY 970 AM. My name is Joel Kaler, owner operator of Kaler Farms in Lidgerwood, North Dakota. We make a patented product called a Cornstalk Guide. It's made out of UHMW, ultra high molecular weight poly, which is extremely durable. Typically what you'll see on corn heads is the idler chain in the sprocket sticks out. We attach to the side of a snout. Our product will keep all the wear off the snout and get it to come into the head smoother without bouncing. Every year, 40% of all food in the U.S. never gets eaten. 40%? That's almost half the food we produce. Food waste is a serious problem. It impacts all of us. And it's expensive. Your family is throwing $1,500 a year in the trash. We're working hard to put food waste on the chopping block. And you can do the same at home. Learn how to cook it, store it, and share it. Just don't waste it. Go to savethefood.com. The Ag Week Soil Health Minute is sponsored by the North Dakota Corn Council and the North Dakota Soybean Council. On this week's Soil Health Minute, we take a trip to the zoo farm at the Red River Zoo to talk about bringing agriculture to kids. NDSU Extension Soil Health Specialist Abby Wick shows us the updates made to the zoo farm and also what we can expect coming up on Agriculture Adventure Day. This week's Soil Health Minute is a little bit different. We're going to talk about bringing agriculture to the city. So we're out here at the Children's Zoo Farm at the Red River Zoo in Fargo, where we've revamped the outside crops area. We've come in and we've hauled in about 20 truckloads of topsoil and, and really built up some good soil in this area. We've put a pollinator strip on the south end, and then we come to wheat, soybean, corn, and then sunflower with cover crops. So what we're trying to do is show the major crops that are grown in North Dakota, but then also some of the tricks that we're using in soil health to, to bring cover crops into the system. This whole project is based on partnerships. There are about 20 different organizations between commodity groups and industry, uh, farmers, and also NDSU Extension that are participating in this to make this the best possible exhibit we can to educate children and families on agriculture. Uh... Our goal here at the zoo farm is to get kids involved in agriculture and also their families. So if they have questions on what crops are grown or what they see in fields surrounding Fargo, this is where they can get some answers. There are a lot of different animals here in the zoo farm for kids to see. So as they're looking at agriculture, they can see all the different parts of agriculture with, between the animals and then also the, the crops. We're here in the sensory garden part of the zoo farm where master gardeners in the area have pulled together different annuals and perennial flowers that kids can come in and smell and see and touch and experience the different flowers as they grow throughout the season. This combine cab is on exhibit year round for kids to climb in and play in. But on Agriculture Adventure Day, July 22nd, we'll have multiple tractors here so kids can walk around them and see what farmers use on their fields. We'll also have activities for kids to learn about soil and crops and farm life. <coughs> so come visit all the animals at the Red River Zoo on July 22nd and get hands-on experience with agriculture. You can get more information by visiting the Red River Zoo webpage. <coughs> 
Now is a good time to be making some big decisions about your 2017 soybean crop. The North Dakota Soybean Council is providing a free seminar to help you with your planning. For the second year, they're offering a mid-season market outlook for soybeans. It will be led by two experts from NDSU, Dr. Frayne Olson and Dr. Bill Wilson. The day-long event will provide guidance on risk management and marketing strategies. Harvest always comes around so fast, and so the best we can do is be ready and think strategically going into marketing that soybean crop, and especially in a year where we have over 7 million acres planted. We've got to know where we're going to send them, how and when. So it's a great opportunity to come and learn and be prepared. Again, the event is free for North Dakota soybean producers. It's Thursday, July 27th from 10 to 3, downtown at NDSU Berry Hall in the Electronic Trading Room. Registration is due by July 20th, and you can call the North Dakota Soybean Council or email Stephanie Sinner. Still ahead on Ag Week TV, hundreds of kids are learning about farming at the fair. WDAY 970 AM has added the Red River Farm Network to its lineup. Join the Red River Farm Network team as we partner with Ag Week to cover the area's number one industry, agriculture. Join us Monday through Friday for Country Morning at 7 AM. Opening markets at 8.30. Market updates at 9.30, 10.30, and 11.30. Closing markets at 1.30. We're committed to reporting agriculture's business on the Red River Farm Network, Ag Week, and WDAY 970 AM. My name is Carson, and I'm a fourth generation corn farmer. The corn that's grown in North Dakota, you could probably trace all over the world. Back growing up, it was always hauled to the local elevator, and now we haul directly to an ethanol plant who processes that corn into a clean burning fuel. The North Dakota ethanol industry uses over 150 million bushels of corn and returns $640 million to the state economy. Advanced Biofuel for America's diesel engines is clean burning and made from renewable sources like soybean oil. Biodiesel fuel works in any diesel engine, reducing emissions, helping us breathe cleaner air. Biodiesel adds value to North Dakota soybeans, creating jobs, improving the environment, increasing our energy independence. Biodiesel, it starts with soybeans, it's fueling America. Where do you go for the latest news in agriculture? AgWeek Magazine. Reaching over 30,000 farmers and ranchers in North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, and Montana. AgWeek provides the most up-to-date information on the markets, the trends, and the people who make it all happen. We're your source for news, not fluff. Dependable. Trusted. AgWeek. Subscribe today by calling 1-800-811-2580. I'm Jenny Garth, and as a mother of three, I know kids worry about a lot of things. Getting enough food to eat shouldn't be one of them. But here in America, that is a real worry for one in five children. This is unacceptable, and something Feeding America is working to solve. Through a nationwide network of food banks, Feeding America serves virtually every community in the United States, including yours. See how you can help your community. Visit feedingamerica.org. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Ag Week TV, presented by Kaler Farms. It's Fair Week in West Fargo. The Red River Valley Fair opened its run on Tuesday, which was also Kids Day. So there were plenty of little ones on hand to learn about farming in the Ag Education Center. The Ag Week TV and sales crew volunteered their time. I had fun teaching kids and their parents about milking with Daisy the cow. Kids could also learn about corn, sugar, and other crops, answer trivia questions about them, and get a prize. The Ag Education Center is sponsored by the Cass County Farm Bureau. Thanks for watching this week's edition of Ag Week TV. For all your ag news, go to agweek.com. We'll see you next week.